This is Linux Unplugged, episode 72, for December 23rd, 2014. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's already tracking Santa's sleigh. My name is Chris, and we have something kind of special for you this week. It's a little different. It's a first for a lot of our shows on the network. This week, we're playing some of the audience's favorite moments as submitted by you. So if it's a train wreck, I'm officially transferring all blame uh, to those of you. No, I'm kidding. No, actually, it's gone through some of our favorite moments. And to be honest, on the Linux Unplugged show, it's just the way it goes, you guys. Some of those... They're rants. A lot of great rants, though. At least I happen to think so. And they inspired a lot of, I think, really good reflection and discussion. Uh, that's what I think Linux Unplugged oftentimes is is all about. And so uh, this week, we're going to go in and look at some of those moments and other moments that you submitted into the show. In fact, it's uh, there's a lot. It's dense. There's a lot to get into. So in fact, uh, so that way I don't have to interrupt. I will be joining you from time to time. Moments throughout the show, Chris will come in and, and spend a holiday moment with you. Uh, But to kind of clear the air, get us ready for it, I think I'm going to thank our first sponsor this week. You guys know him. You guys love him. That's the amazing folks over at Ting. Go to linux.ting.com. That's going to get you not only a $25 discount off your first Ting device, but a little feather in your cap for supporting the Linux Unplugged show. Linux.ting.com. Ting is mobile that makes sense. Uh, Ting is my mobile service provider. And as I sit here and take a holiday sip from a holiday beverage and reflect on the things that uh, I do feel very thankful for, Ting is one of them. I'm coming in now on two years of Ting service. You can get started by going to linux.ting.com. No more contract. No more termination fee. No more scams. No more getting you to pay for data that you may or may not use or a certain amount of text messages you may or may not use. Just pay for what you actually end up using. That's how Ting works. Ting takes your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. They add them all up at the end of the month, whatever bucket you fall into, that's all you got to pay. You want to turn on hotspot? You want to tether that? Then just pay for the data. You don't have to be in some sort of special plan. And Ting has no hold customer service. I don't need it. But to be honest, I've never had to call them. Uh, I take advantage of their incredible dashboard. Uh, but if uh, I have friends and family, I, I, abs- I absolutely let them know, you know what? You can call Ting and they'll answer your tough questions. They hire the Android geeks. Give them the ability to solve your problem. Give them the authority to resolve any kind of account issue, and then they have them answer the phone when it rings. I know. It's a crazy concept. Linux.ting.com. They have that powerful online control panel where you can take control of your account, turn things on and off as you need them. It's really impressive. And one of the things you may have heard about is Ting is expanding into GSM next year. They're going to have CDMA and GSM coverage, and they posted up a video where they talked to one of their executives about that. So I'm going to play it for you. I've been happy since my switch to Ting a year ago. Any chance that Ting will offer GSM service besides CDMA? So I'm sure you've seen by now that we are actually offering a GSM service in addition to uh, Sprint. There are two great things that that gives us. First, it gives people access to a wider variety of phones that they may already own or get in the secondary market. Second, probably a little more specifically, it does now mean that you can go down to the Apple Store, buy an unlocked uh, iPhone, new iPhone 6, 6 Plus, grab a SIM from us, pop it in, and use Ting. And, and, and for a lot of people, that's been a, a real limitation. Uh, you know, I do think it's worth noting that this is and, not or, and we're thrilled to be able to offer multiple networks. Linux.ting.com. Mobile that makes sense. Thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Unplugged show. They're also getting into fiber internet to change up landlines. Love Ting. And I think you should go check them out. Start saving right now. And they have a special $100 and 50 bones uh, credit if you have to cancel a line that has an early termination on it. No more ETS with Ting. Linux.ting.com. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Unplugged show. Well, Systemd sure came up a lot this year, didn't it? 
And uh, there was a lot of different discussions on the Linux Unplugged show, but we figured we've got to touch on it once officially to mark it for 2014. So this is one of the highest submitted discussions around Systemd. Enjoy. Did you guys see the uh, roll up your sleeves? We may need to fork Debian site. Did you guys catch this? Oh, boy. Uh, and I'll just read uh, the first uh, paragraph here. Uh, we are veteran, which is bolded, by the way, veteran Unix admins, and we are concerned about what's happening to GNU slash Linux Debian edition, uh, and they're uh, considering forking the project. I, I want to stop right here. Okay. I, I think that's a great idea. I think fork it. Like, instead of instead of delaying the progress of the distribution or the direction, yeah, fork it and go your own way. That seems like the, that actually seems like the right approach to take, especially if you're never going to be satisfied with the system D uh, uh, version of Debian. You know, that, that seems like a pretty reasonable response. And I, uh, I, I hope they do. I think the competition would be good. The thing that I can't get past, and it seems like a lot of other people have uh, picked up on it, is, is the language used there. Veteran Unix admins and, and bolded. That, what that does is sort of projects old farts. And I'm not trying to be derogatory. I'm just saying, like, from a messaging standpoint, people are saying... That makes you sound like a bunch of old farts, and it pe then people sort of write it off. Ah, what do they care? A bunch of stick in the muds. And it's sort of like, it immediately makes people not take it very seriously. Well, you know, looking at it from my perspective, I think it's a combination of, quote-unquote, old farts, as well as people that are of the mind that if it isn't broke, why fix it? At least from their perspective. And so you might have an inner mixture of individuals in that space. Wimpy, do you think they're just uh, crazy? Um, <laughs> well, they're exercising their right to free speech and all power to their elbow and everything and if they want to have a go at forking Debbie and then I think everyone should just stand back and let them get on with it and let themselves burn, <laughs> burn see themselves how it goes. out trying. <laughs> yeah. Well just, said. Just, just, let's just try, take those two words together. Fork Debian. Okay. Forking yeah. is hard. I have first hand of experience of forking really small projects in the uh, comparison with Debian. So they want to fork Debian. <laughs> Just think about all of the infrastructure that's involved there and all of the platforms and everything. It's just crazy nonsense. And uh, Ian Jackson's obviously uh, got an opinion about this and he posted his uh, thing to the mailing list to suggest that this was uh, you know, evaluated one last time very expressly stating he didn't want to turn this into a system D versus whatever in its system debate. And then the internet explodes with system D Inferno again. It, this is so disappointing. I it's know. just it's just laughable. And and if they want to fork Debian, <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> do that. Do that thing. I'm um, I'm all for it. I'm gonna watch that gleefully from afar. Yeah, I, I would be pretty skeptical myself. And, and Vault, uh, you think, uh, no, no, don't fork. Don't do not do that. We need more resources as it is, not less people working on the same stuff. Well, that's obviously the, 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 the <laughs> my actual practical point is, no, don't fork it. Find a way to accommodate, yeah, you know, multiple you know, Linux uh, systems uh, in Debian. I'm starting but, to change. You know, if you want to fork yeah. Debian, yeah, go on. It, to go me, on, do it. The, if, the, if they're never going to be interested in being involved with the project in that state, then they should just fork it. You're not really losing resources because if they weren't going to cooperate anyways, you're not losing them. They already, they're already lost. So let them go off and do their own thing. Well, no, the thing is, is that, no, well, yeah, okay, if they want to fork Debian, fork Debian. But there's there's system BSD, there's use less D, yeah. there are shims around system D. If they were really serious about coming up with an alternative, they would be looking at those projects mm -hmm. in terms of developing them and supporting them within the Debian community rather than saying we're going to fork Debian, which is frankly insane. Well, yeah, you're talking the biggest distribution there is, the mother of most of our distributions. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah you, that's a huge undertaking if you're even going think well, to think about that. Would you do a complete fork or would it be more like sort of a clone of straight up Debian where you're just constantly swapping out the system D parts for something else. Well, one thing that comes to mind that I want to point out here is that now last time I checked, most computers with, with blogging platforms attached don't have breathalyzers ready. <laughs> so it's entirely possible. They were fit shaped and they got on. And, yeah, Debian, fight me. Yeah, uh, maybe. No, I mean, you know. no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you who's a little S faced. How about this one? How about this one? 
ForkFedora.org. Shall we fork oh, Fedora? That's brilliant. And then, yeah, and then here's I the like next line. One. Not really. It's doing great. Maybe we're not veteran enough. <laughs> that's great. That's really That good. is fantastic. That's the best response. <laughs> they, s- <laughs> they sound like they're really housed. You know what? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're really housed, right? right yeah. I would like to buy a beer I, for I've already guys. verified this was a factual thing. I, uh, anyway, yeah, sorry. no, Matt did prove that, that, that yeah, did. he did actually later up on G+. Plus. Almost I think like was, 10 people on the whole internet, but still, we exist. Yeah, that actually is getting housed as a term. I don't. It's like got a ridiculous origin, though, or something. I don't remember. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's abbreviated from, you know, the other word. But, <laughs> Uh, so, so guys, you just seen Valor over here. It was hilarious. Uh, so okay, but this fork business, like, shall we fork Fedora? Time to fork Debian. I've never. Well, actually, we have. The only time I think we've ever seen the Linux community this riled up and just unable to just move forward for a long time was like the Microsoft Novell deal where you had boycott oh, Novell have- prop up and you had all this stuff and there was such decisive lines and it went on for like two years but really not I mean you know it was it was not as bad for two years but it really went on for a while and this is like we haven't had a good old classic drama like this since then it's like the good old days again <laughs> hoo ah right? oh I remember the old Nobel thing and I'm, th- I'm sitting there going thinking that's great I'm gonna go watch TV now because I'm just like this is gonna be a week long thing and people are gonna blow it over yeah that still cracks me up yeah, just uh, alright wimpy go ahead ask the question that's on everybody's mind <laughs> well <sighs> so I'm, I'm putting myself out there again as the as the bloke that says, you know, System D is really quite good, but I I often wonder reading what some of the people say about System D and also listening to other podcasts and what they have to say about System D, and I'm left with the impression of you've never actually used it. Not yeah. only have you never actually used it, you've never actually sat down and written a unit file. You're not a package maintainer. You haven't had to deal with init scripts, and you haven't seen the benefits of migrating a uh, package from an init script to System D, and and the many other benefits of System D. Now, I can appreciate that people are very, very firm in their opinion that they like the way things are, and and there's a place for that. But I think a lot of the speculation and uh, commentary about system D is being had by people who simply do not know what they're talking about. Now, I'm not suggesting necessarily that Fork Debian falls into this camp. They would claim to be seasoned uh, Linux administrators and Debian uh, veterans quite. Um, So maybe they do know what they're talking about and they have legitimate reasons as to why they feel system D is not going to, to suit them. But there are some podcasts where I've heard them debating the uh, the various init systems and talking about the pros and cons, and then admitting partway through their you know slagging off of System D they've never used it. And yeah, you just think well, so what, how, you know, how are you qualified to have an opinion? My uh, my so my stance on the System D uh, discussion, I think if you look over the history of this show, has an arc where I'm pretty neutral, don't give a crap. And then I become pretty pro system D, and then I get to a point where I was a little belligerent to people who didn't, who didn't seem to think going forward with system D was a good idea because the reason I I don't know if belligerent is the right word, but I'll just label it that. Uh, the reason why I felt that way is because as a, as a sys admin of like 14, 15 years, there are literally things that I see in system D that I think, if I had that when I was managing servers, I would have hated my job so much less. Like, it's not just small stuff that I see in System D. Uh, some of the things that System D brings as a whole, I see as fundamentally necessary for Linux to remain competitive at scale. Like, without I those agree. things, and, with, and without those things, FreeBSD could easily eat our lunch, really. Because essentially, yeah. we're, we're, we're just as capable. And, but System D offers so many things, and the problem is you really don't know how important they are until you've deployed Linux at scale, or you have a, a, you know, a very network-demanding thing, or you have something that has to be as absolutely minimal as possible and support socket activation, or you need something that's integrated with namespaces. All these things that are edge cases but together matter so much and, may, and are so important at keeping Linux competitive, not just on the server but also in mobile. 
that when you when you come when you argue against system D, what you have to realize is you have to really come with something that's extremely compelling because what you are arguing for is essentially removing what I in in my personal opinion and, I, and I'm not saying it's right, but in my personal opinion are fundamentally critical features to keep Linux competitive. So if you're going to say yeah. no system D, you've got to have an answer for those problems. And, and, yeah, I don't think you and I can have a debate about this because I think we're clearly uh, on the same side of the fence and we've got, we've got our personal opinions, it sounds like, for largely similar reasons. Um, so really what we need is somebody to step up and tell us why we're wrong. And I, I, I think part of it is some of the more vocal people debating this are not the same people who are as impacted by it. Like, I think there's a group of people that care a lot, but they're just not as vocal about debating it. Um, I think I'm trying to because I get emails that seem really well reasoned, uh, but I even then I've still not been convinced. The biggest things that convince me that it might be a problem are always the what if scenarios, and I think yeah, if that happens, we could have a problem. But that's not a today problem. That's a what if problem. Quite, so. quite. Anyways, so how do we get talking about? Oh yeah, the forks. Yeah, so there you go. The <laughs> system D conversation <laughs> once again has been stirred back up by these project forks. <laughs> And, you know, what's interesting is you check the Linux forums, like r slash uh, Linux and, and just general discussion forums, and people are constantly still asking about it. It is genuinely a topic that even though it seems like we've talked about it ad nauseum, people still seem to care about. Uh, I guess that's sort of the uh, fun of being a Linux user is you get to care about such nitty-gritty things like your display compositor and system D and all that stuff. So I, that's, I guess that's why, we're, that's why we do it. And that concludes the System D portion of this show. Uh, however, something does tell me we'll probably still be talking about System D in uh, 2015. I can't help myself, and it's obviously a huge area of interest for the Linux community. 2015 is going to be a big year for System D. 2015 is also going to be a big year for our sponsor, DigitalOcean. And I mean that. They have some very impressive stuff in the works that you guys are going to find out about very soon. Head over to DigitalOcean.com right now. Check them out. Give them a ding for that. DigitalOcean. And use our special promo code, Unplugged December, while you're over there. Unplugged December. Remember, that's our promo code of domination. Unplugged December when you check out. That'll give you a $10 credit, and you'll see why you want that. But first, let me back up a bit. I feel perhaps I have gone too fast for you. I want to slow down and treat it right and tell you about DigitalOcean, a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up a cloud server up in the cloud, my friends, with root access and unbelievable speeds. And speaking of speeds, you can actually get the cloud server created in less than a minute, and pricing plans start at only $5 per month. Remember that promo code? The promo code of domination. Unplugged December. Remember that? Well, that's going to get you a $10 credit. Well, I just said it's $5 for one of their rigs. 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a freaking terabyte of transfer, my friends. A terabyte. That's a lot of Christmas movies. Or something else. I don't know. I don't judge. Honey Badger over here. What's great is DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. So you're going to get a data center somewhere that makes you look like a boss. Or you could diversify your regionalness with that. I think it's pretty great. But really, what's great is that interface. DigitalOcean has the most intuitive control panel for managing something like this. I wouldn't have thought it could be done. It really is great. And power users can replicate the control panel, the functionality, on a much, much larger scale with DigitalOcean straightforward API that I'm told is gorgeous. And I've uh, recently been checking out some of the applications that take advantage of that API, like Swimmer. Yeah, it's called Swimmer, a full-featured open-source Android client for DigitalOcean. Look at this thing. It's open source. It's up on GitHub right now. You can check it out. And this allows you to manage your DigitalOcean droplets. You can SSH into the droplet, reboot, power cycle, shut down, resize a droplet, snapshot it, rebuild it, turn backups on, create a droplet from your phone. Amazing. Look at all of the options you have with this thing. This is what's so cool about DigitalOcean's API, and because it's so great... Developers are excited to use it. And now you can go take advantage of something like this, like an open source Android app, so you can even trust it. That's so awesome. DigitalOcean.com. And use our promo code Unplugged December, the promo code of domination, to get a $10 credit when you check out. Try out that $5 rig. Go deploy GitLab. Go deploy uh, Ruby on Rails, WordPress, Ghost with one click. Man, that is so slick. I really think that's it. It's such an impressive setup. And the one-click installation, you combine that with the spin-up time, and you can really get hauling fast. DigitalOcean.com. 
Unplugged December when you check out. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Linux Unplugged program. You guys, I'm looking forward to 2015. I know you guys have something. I, I, I can't even say. I can't even say, but let's just say I know some things, and I'm really impressed with what I know. Uh, up next, though, is an interview with a Tox developer. This was sent in by quite a bit of you. Encrypted messaging space is something I'm following really closely myself. Uh, I find it to be a fascinating field with a lot of cool things happening right now, but not one that I've really zoned in on as like my go-to messaging platform. Uh, so when we had this chance to interview a Tox developer, I was really interested in what they had to say. I hope you will be too. Enjoy. So uh, I want to welcome uh, two developers from the Tox project onto the show. Uh, joining us on Mumble right now, we have STQ and I run Gen2. So I know uh, Tox started up as sort of a discussion thread, I, and I, I'm told, I, I think it started on 4chan. Um, and now here we are, we're what, seven, eight months down the road, it's become a very active project. Uh, so where, where is that from where it started versus well, where it's at today? Well, Tox started as, uh, well, I actually, I had this idea, this very basic idea, and then, well, uh, I was in, on a, a thread on a G on a <laughs> oh. well, that was speaking about uh, how Skype is, uh, well, private. Yeah. privacy issues yeah. with Skype so yeah. well I had just well I just decided okay hey let's uh, I was actually a bit uh, maybe drunk at the moment or something and I said <laughs> okay <laughs> okay let's uh, let's make uh, a Skype replacement so that's that's how it started and then well I was very impressed by the positive response from uh, everyone so I said okay let's let's start writing code let's let's start planning stuff and uh, well I s that's how talk started <laughs> so it started kind of as a crazy idea that maybe you after you thought about it for a little bit realized like, this could be a good idea have you worked on this kind of stuff before or, uh, or something like this before well, uh, I played around with some uh, like BitTorrent DHT. I, I did a couple of uh, scripts to uh, like. I once made a, a script to uh, find out which uh, to try to track everything on the BitTorrent DHT. But uh, well, uh, there were some little bandwidth issues. I would uh, we well. I would have needed a big server and something, so the idea kind of uh, died. But uh, that gave me a bit of uh, experience on like how peer-to-peer uh, -peer software works and everything. So that's uh, that's how. Uh, yeah. Well, can you tell me a little bit about? And I I guess it's actually pronounced Salt, but the uh, the networking and cryptography library that Talks is is sitting on primarily is is this the big piece of functionality here? Or how does what is the what does this component play? What role does that play? Well, that's the it's uh, <laughs> that I seriously I I like that crypto I love that crypto library. It's uh, it's very simple to use and everything. And it's very secure. I don't think it talks would have uh, worked without it. <laughs> it's uh, since uh, well, well talks when talks started, we didn't know uh, what uh, <laughs> what crypto library we would use. Right. I mean, it seems like a huge so, choice to make, right? Yeah, but then someone suggested it in a thread, and then I looked at it, and I just saw this is perfect. It's simple to use. It's uh, it's fast. It's yeah. uh, it's very secure. It protects against all types of uh, attack, timing attacks, etc. So that's uh, so we picked that, and I started reading a lot. Okay, so how how do I implement this correctly in talks without uh, without uh, screwing up things? So I well, read, that was <laughs> my question because I I've heard that I think also the Telegram Messenger program uses the salt library but i guess they maybe if i don't know the details but i guess they've implemented it incorrectly have you looked at that situation and, and tried to, to kind of balance what they did wrong and and adjust accordingly no. for talks no telegram they they don't use the salt library oh, okay. they use their uh, custom uh, custom uh, crypto implementation ah. if they would have used the salt library they their crypto would have been fine nobody would be complaining about it right 
Gotcha. So something that seemed kind of like a big deal, uh, you guys got accepted, the Tox project got accepted into the Google Summer of Code, but you know a lot of people have asked, is that going to influence the project in any way? What about their independence? What are your thoughts on the Summer of Code and what it means for that aspect of the project? But, yeah, I'll go ahead and answer this. Sure. Well, I think with Google Summer of Code, we're really going to be able to finish a lot of things that we wouldn't have the time to do that due to our prior commitments, we would never be able to do. We would be able to have people who have different skill sets in areas we might not have. They would be able to help out that way. Okay. So, and you know, what about this criticism that people have said, oh, well, this is a bad sign. This is about influence. What do you think of that? Is, is there, has there been communications from Google about suggestions or anything like that? No, they don't do anything like that. They exist purely to foster the development of open source projects. No secret influences, no link to this secret library, nothing like that. <laughs> no uh, insert go to fail line here. In a <laughs> well, that's good. That's good considering that, uh, you know, there's a lot of hopes riding on a secure messenger. And I got to tell you guys, this is a pretty contested space right now. Um, so I think people are looking for a lot of things to pull out to kind of uh, uh, criticize on. Um and to that end, I think, um, I, and I didn't, I, I, I don't really know if there is something to be worried about here, but a lot of people have criticized that they started as a threat on 4chan. Um, and have you guys dealt with growing pains as a result of that? Well, no. we did start like that, but as we developed, we got people with skill sets from Reddit and all these areas and right, sort I mean, of nurtured. That's exactly. I mean, so when I, I mean, not to interrupt, I'm sorry, but when I, when I heard, so I've seen this question, it was sent into our show a few times. And to me, it just seems like these are locations that technical people hang out. True. So 4chan specifically, that little area is a lot of trolling. I think <laughs> it was pure luck that the people who we have now, that all the skills matched up just perfectly. Yeah. Well, I and I and I know I've, I know it's something that's on people's radar, and it maybe seems like one of those things down the road. It, it probably it it probably won't be as big of a factor. But what any other growing pains you guys are seeing as the project is as becoming more aware, people are becoming more aware of it. Not really. Well, uh, there's uh, always a bit of uh, issues, but um, we can, we we've dealt with them, and it's, yeah, uh, good. Well, okay. So uh, now that's the big picture stuff. I want to talk a little bit about maybe features and, and stuff that Tox is hoping to support down the road. Uh, what are your plans for um, three? There's three major things I've seen requests from the audience. Uh, conference call setups. Do you guys have any plans to do things like group calls and things like that down the road? Yes. Okay, good. What about multiple presence? As in, I can be logged in on a, on on multiple computers, and the message goes to all locations. Or maybe I'm on my I'm on my Android phone, and I'm also on my laptop, and I want my messages and calls to go to both locations. Is that possible with the security model you're using now? You know, we haven't worked out something like that just yet. We're still working on a lot of our group chats, how we can do audio and video, how we can do things like that. But when the time comes, I know we'll be able to reach that area. Yeah, it's uh, it's possible, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, later after after we've done the TCP stuff, after we've done the the group chats and the yeah. work and uh, well. Later. So is that how you're focusing right now? It seems like the Tox clients that I've tried are all text chat based to get that working, and then is the is the plan to then to get the next set of functionality working, and then the next. Yeah, it's uh, it's how uh, well. It, I think it's the best way to develop software to uh, do make a feature, test it correctly, mm -hmm. add another, add another, and uh, that's. Uh, so what's on your immediate list, and then what's on your sort of after I get this next immediate problem solved, after I get this thing that's bugging me fixed, I really want to start working on. So what are those two things? Well, we have first. Uh, the thing that I want to finish first, well, that I'm working on right now, is uh, the TCP uh, TCP stuff. So that uh, I want to add uh, TCP relay functionality to Tox uh, nodes, so that uh, people that are behind bad NATs and uh, can uh, <laughs> can also use talks currently talks mm. only works people with that can uh, hold punch through their nats 
but okay. that's not everyone. Yeah. Some people are behind enterprise NATs, some symmetric NATs that are weird and um, and block certain, uh, like, yeah. Um, they only have a maximum number of UDP connections that can, well, that can be a problem because, well, yeah. Tox needs to connect <laughs> to a bunch of people. For a discovery so, and whatnot, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, I, I look at this and I think if Tox was really successful, I, if if you could truly create a Skype replacement that was secure, you would have a system that would be used by by journalists, by dissidents, by the paranoid, and by cheaters. And uh, it would be this: these groups of people would fundamentally rely on this technology to be absolutely iron clad solid have you considered code audits and and maybe at a certain like quote unquote official release point saying we're going to audit the code have a third party look at the code well yes of course but we want to wait till a lot of our major features are done and talking about what you mentioned earlier we're designing talks to be something that everyone can use someone talking someone somewhere i have no idea what i'm saying right now but Long story short, we want to design something that's so fast, so easy, so smooth that people would use it instead of Skype. I mean, yeah. we're not going to truly accomplish our goal unless everyone's using this, unless there's nothing that can be spied on, nothing that can be snooped. Security isn't a selling point for end users, but we want to give it to everyone. Hmm. That's an interesting way to put it. I... I I mean, it's definitely is. It's definitely for some, but yeah, you're right. For the general user, it's not really it's not really a big deal. Uh, you know, the only really other question I had sent in from the audience that was kind of kicking around is, uh, how do you guys plan to make money, and are you going to take donations? No, we might take donations. And so Gentoo has been talking about it a bit. So right now, all of our expenses, our build systems, everything comes out of my own pocket, and I haven't really been taking anything in. Well, you're a good man, SDQ. Uh, uh, so, have you considered like uh, uh, a donation system or or a, like a Kickstarter system or something like that? Um, can you repeat the question? I couldn't hear you. Are you thinking about are you, are you guys? Because the reason I'm asking is that we had a few people send in like Longplay wrote in and asked if uh, you guys would. He wants to send you money, but he couldn't find a way to donate. Are you considering doing a donation model? We might you know, put we, uh, a donation button on the website. Yeah. But, uh, that's because uh, the reason I didn't want donations to, well, us accepting donations at the beginning is, well, what if uh, we, we just started and then right, yeah. everything fails and, well, right. people are going to be yeah. angry and everything, but, well, we've, uh, we've gone a long way from there, so, well, we Maybe. might uh, yeah. put... Uh, that's good. It's good. You know, yeah, you want to make sure you got something that uh, you can you can show for before you ask people to start taking money. Well, also, I'll open it up to the mumble room and see if there's any questions that the group has. Um, and you guys, if you do, just ping me in the chat room with any questions you have for uh, the folks, and we'll we'll get through those. And the chat room, I'm also checking your questions as as we go. But uh, guys, I want to thank you for coming on Linux Unplugged. It's this project I'm going to be watching. You know, I'm I'm still really interested in picking the mobile messenger of the future. And right now, the Jupiter Broadcasting Network really kind of uses Skype a lot for our shows because at the end of the day, it seems to be the the sort of the best combination of deployment and, and ease of use and actual video and audio quality simultaneously. I'm really excited about the Talks Project. We talked about it a little bit this last Sunday on the Linux Action Show. And uh, I demoed a couple of different apps you can use for it. It's early days right now. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'd I, I want to encourage you guys to keep going at it, keep working at it, because this is a space that people are going to be more and more interested over the uh, the next couple of years. Crossroads asks, uh, how does this compare to other chat programs, e.g., BT Chat or Tor Chat? And actually, that's a great question. What, have you guys seen the re the announcement of Tor Chat? And what are your thoughts on that versus Talks? Well, yeah. Tors, I oh, do you want to? Yeah, I, I can answer. Sure. <laughs> okay. Well, Tor Chat is, uh, they're going more on the anonymous, uh, well, they want to make an anonymous chat, but uh, Tox is, uh, isn't anonymous. You connect directly to the people you're speaking to because uh, we want performance uh, because, well, streaming, uh, 
high resolution video through Tor is well doesn't really work well. Uh, that's true, right? Yeah, that's a so, great point. Yeah, I hadn't thought about the video aspect of it. And, and yeah. to reiterate further, yeah. Go ahead. I think you. I mean, we're trying to design something that everyone can use, yeah. not just the paranoid. Well, and and to that end, is that why? I mean, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of different Tox clients. There's not like one official Tox client. I guess it would be conceivable that you could have chat programs like Pigeon out there and others that support Tox and Tor Chat at the same time, right? Yeah, Pigeon for a, there's a Tox plugin in development already, so. <laughs> It uh, it already supports uh, talks. But. Well, very good. That's very interesting, you guys. And uh, I, I'm glad you're working on this, to tell you the truth, because uh, one of my predictions for uh, the the uh, the Linux Action Show for 2014 was that there would be an explosion in secure messaging. So you guys are right now confirming my prediction. So that's awesome for me. Most definitely. <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? Uh, so, you guys, I know, I I know, you guys probably are not big fans of giving out timelines, but do you have a general big picture timeline or roadmap of when features will roll out or be available? I can tell you the well, the order at which we're going to roll them out, but timelines are a bit. Uh, <laughs> oh, I take that. I'll take order of that you want to roll things out well, for sure. Well, first of all, we're going to roll out the TCP relays. Then after that, we're going to work uh, on. Uh, fixing our group chats and making audio video work in group chats and well that's the two main that should take uh, a while because they're they're two very big uh, features uh, that's they're gonna need lots of testing and everything and after that we're gonna concentrate on well may whatever uh, well maybe optimizing code or uh, trying to implement other features like offline messaging and mm. uh, like uh, how someone who wants to be logged in at two computers that we might uh, might work on that it it depends on well what we feel people want the most what they're asking for yeah well let me ask you this what if somebody daredevil's making a great question making a great point in our chat room what if what if you uh, were uh, you wake up one day, you go to Slashdot or TechMeme or Reddit or whatever, and you see a top headline, new secure messenger launched, available on Android, iOS, and the desktop. Um, it's, it's awesome. It's rock solid. And you dig through it, oh, and you see they're charging, they're charging for the app. And then you'd read through the details, and you realize, holy crap, they're using talks. How do you feel about people creating clients or potentially business models on top of a system that you're building today? Well, the core is licensed under the GPL v3, so they can't take the code and not give uh, the source back. So, well, if someone does take it and improves the source, and if they make money, I don't care if they, uh, because they're improving the software. So, Daredevil, I didn't realize you're in here. Go ahead. And did you have more you wanted to add to that? Daredevil, no? Uh, sorry, yeah. I'm here. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So what happened is, uh, I'm, uh, the reason I got this question is because uh, I was wondering more, uh, I know it's GPL and people are contributing back, but there's kind of business models that could involve, for example, a company making their own nodes in a way that um, would allow them to mimic users. And I mean, depends, of course, on the intrinsics of the project, but then go to something that is uh, something uh, a little bit deviated from original tax plans, and it goes like it uses tax source code. It uses all like uh, of the like like uh, Bitcoin's Litecoin that kind of thing. Yeah, kind of, sorta. So it, it yeah. will be with some differences that would make more uh, a company-driven uh, perspective and not actually providing the users direct access. So. What are the measures in place for you to incentivize people to just come to your project instead of just working doing something crazy that goes completely out of town? Well, if if a company uh, does something like that, well, and users actually use the software from that company, that means they're doing something good. <laughs> so that's because, a win for you. Well, we can always take uh, the code uh, code and uh, put it in our th in our project, <laughs> right? And uh, well, wow. so uh, Josh, it's like SSA. 
Go ahead. That's a good point. It's like, okay. Oh, okay. I mean, that's an interesting yeah. way to think about it. Yeah, like OpenBSD makes SSH and they give it away for people to do whatever they want with. Right. Great point. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a, that's an interesting way to kind of frame that. Uh, Josh, you had a kind of a question more about funding, right? Yes, I did. Um, so you guys talked about maybe monetizing or you know, accepting donations in the future. So what is your opinion on allowing you know, people to back certain features with something like Bounty Source uh, and allow you guys to get paid to like implement certain features like group chats and maybe help speed the process along or provide some sort of monetary incentive? You know, I think something like that really hurts people's trust if something doesn't need a timeline. If something looks good, looks like it's easy to do, but it doesn't come up and it ends up taking a lot longer than it should or something, people get disappointed. Hmm. Well, the main issue is that uh, <laughs> implementing something is uh, relatively easy. Implementing something that's bug-free and works perfectly, that's, uh, that's hard. <laughs> so, well, that's... Uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Yeah, and you don't. Yeah, I, I it is it. So it's something to consider, I think, because it's really fascinating to really. It truly tells you what what people's priorities are when they assign a dollar value to it in a way that is so much more tangible than than emails and and bug requests and all these things. When people are actually willing to put money down for something, then you really know it's it's literally of a value to them. Uh, so, I, but I do understand you don't want to overset expectations, and you guys seem to be, you know. Uh, walking that line pretty closely. Uh, I'm going to take a quick break right here. And when we get back, I want to talk a little bit about maybe your thoughts on the future of uh, mobile for talks. But first, I hope you'll have some time this holiday to visit linuxacademy.com slash unplug so you can take advantage of our special 33% unplug discount, which is an incredible deal. Linuxacademy.com slash unplug. Go check them out right now. There's never been a better time. Step-by-step video courses, downloadable comprehensive study guides. Bring them offline with you. This is reading material, but also audio and video material. You can plug it into your podcast player. You can learn from the presenters. They've got great audio setups. They're genuinely passionate about the topics. That's what makes them such great educators. And you can sit there and absorb it as you travel, as you're in the shower, like Skooky Sprite. It comes with your own server, too. So when the courseware requires it, they automatically spin up a server for you on the back end. And all of this, you get to choose from 7-plus Linux distributions and have that courseware and the VMs automatically adjust to match the distribution you've chosen. You can keep track of your progress as you go and quiz yourself. And Linux Academy has rolled out courses recently on Docker. Great opportunity to go learn Docker. Vagrant and Puppet. And I'm talking about stuff that takes you from beginner, absolute beginner, to professional, ready to be certified. One of their uh, students recently took the AWS course, and I got an email about this. After the AWS course, he got a certification, and he actually went and got a job at Amazon. It's amazing. They have a community there that helps kind of bump you. When you're having sort of a down moment and you're having a hard time motivating, that's just enough to just give you a little bump to keep you going. And they're... The management system you have when you log into your Linux Academy dashboard is really, really great. They have something called learning plans, too, where you can say, okay, Linux Academy, I got this much time this week. And then Linux Academy will generate courseware for you based on your availability, custom tailored to you. And it can send you email reminders about quizzes and stuff. I mean, it's a really good way to adapt the program to you to match your ebb and flows of availability. It's, it's life. We all have it. And you can get started by going to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Also, uh, a lot of great new uh, DevOps content has been flooding into Linux Academy as well as live streams. Uh, so check it out, linuxacademy.com. We've also got some development stuff for Android, Python, PHP. Uh, if OpenStack is something you've heard a lot about but you're, you don't really have your head wrapped around it, great OpenStack courses. Great great OpenStack courses, uh, some of the best in the industry, really, right there. And, and in fact, uh, some of the biggest companies in the industry are working with Linux Academy because their courseware is so great. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Unplugged program. Okay, well, before Ubuntu 14.10's release, there was a lot of talk about how boring of a release it might be. I made an offhand comment in the news one episode, and man, oh man, did I get a lot of response. Popey was... One of the blokes who felt perhaps my comment needed to be responded to. So he and I had a nice chat about that. Uh, All right. So I want to move into the topic that was sparked after Sunday's coverage of Ubuntu 14.10. And before we get into that, 
So uh, in the Linux Action Show subreddit and in the email, there are a lot of people that apparently decided that uh, I am very biased against Ubuntu. And one of the reasons cited was that I skipped over talking Unity's touch support when we were talking about GNOME 3.14. I just want to clear the ground right now, just quickly mention that was not me sliding Unity at all. That was just me focusing on GNOME 3.14 because we were covering GNOME 3.14. We were not covering what Unity can do. We were covering what GNOME can do. So I just didn't mention it. Doesn't mean I was intentionally, because I don't like it, leaving it out. It was because I was talking about GNOME and what GNOME was adding and what Wayland was adding. So, uh, but there is more contention over our coverage of Ubuntu 14.10 itself. Uh, it's probably, you know, people, you know what, Matt, people hate crickets, I think is what it is. People just hate crickets. I think it is. Yeah, I think the crickets may have been <laughs> yeah. something that kind of set folks off. Yeah, I, I think it's funny. Yeah, it's just too much, I think. Should have um, been a bomb going off. And I think people love that. People love explosions. A lot of it boils down to a misunderstanding of. I think a lot of people attributed it to arch fanboyism on my part, and that I was such an arch fanboy that I was putting Ubuntu down because of it. And I think a lot of it was probably coming from people who haven't watched the shows for a long time, uh, because I think you know people. Sometimes what happens is people see that I'm pro something. I, uh, you know, I was very pro Ubuntu, very pro Unity or the desktop for a long time. I still think it's a good desktop. Uh, and so because I was pro something for a long time, it is to them illogical that I would now say something that is not pro because, you know, once you like something, you're supposed to like it forever. But I think people who watch me know that my opinions change over time based on results and the way things go. I'll give you a great example. Uh, I think you could go back in time and you could clearly see episodes where I was slamming on Fedora, pretty handily slamming on Fedora for maybe oh, yeah. the entire review. Now, my position on Fedora has changed quite a bit as they sort of are addressing some of these problems. I would say I still approach Fedora with some trepidation and, and some level of skepticism. But I am I'm impressed with the changes they're making. I'm impressed with their project leader. Obviously, we've had him on the show twice in a few weeks. In, a, in, a, in the times, of course, the second time wasn't really about Fedora. But uh, so, it, you know, it was funny because in that very episode of people saying, well, Chris is such an arch fanboy, they were completely negating the fact that we had like a 25-minute interview with the lead of the project, of the Fedora project. My point is, it's not a bias towards Arch that influences my reporting on Ubuntu. I don't have any distribution bias at all. That would be ridiculous. The reason I go with Arch is because it does everything I need it to do, and it doesn't feel like a distribution. It doesn't have politics. It doesn't have councils. It doesn't have advisory boards. It just is. And you don't have to worry about the politics and the people. It, just, it feels just like a meta layer on top of Linux. That's why I like Arch. Just I could just as easily switch to Fedora next when they've got that rolling. Like I could see that happening in you know in the next year or so. I don't have allegiance to any one particular distribution. I do have a bias though, and that bias is a bias towards winning. People who are doing it right. People who are producing results. People who are coming through on what they say they will do. And as a company, any project, doesn't have to be Ubuntu, as any project slides in one direction or the other, my coverage of that project will reflect that slide. So if they say, now I'm sorry, Poby, but let's just say there were supposed to be two phones already in the marketplace. Let's just say Mir was already supposed to ship. Let's say that Ubuntu 14.10 is the most boring Linux desktop release we've ever seen from the most important distro maker out there. Let's accept all of these things as genuine facts, unfortunate facts, but let's just accept those things. Me reporting on that does not mean I have an Ubuntu uh, agenda where I want to tear Ubuntu down. It's me reporting on the state of Ubuntu, one of the more important distributions in the market. It's not coming from an arch influence. It's coming from following these things and maybe a little disappointment. Does that make sense? Like, it, Matt, can you fill in? Am I missing any gaps here? I think you pretty much hit it. I mean, it's, you know, it's basically different. It really boils down to different strokes for different folks. I think it's just where it is at the end of the day. And for you, you have a specific set of expectations that one distro or another may or may not be meeting. And that could, of course, change over time. I think what I'm, I think what I'm trying to get to is it feels like the conversation, I don't know if poisoned is the right word or derailed, but... Um, Derailed's this, right, yeah. This latching on to, oh, well, he's just saying that because he's a fanboy. Or Chris is too biased by Arch to cover it. Just me saying that out loud sounds ridiculous and childish. I would, the, the, the concept 
that I would have some sort of allegiance to some Linux distribution that would influence my coverage of it is ridiculous. What I will do is identify a Linux distribution that does something interesting, and if they're doing that something better than everybody else is, I might suggest those other distributions try to adopt some of those things, but that doesn't make them invalid. I've used every distribution out there. I also don't report much on Mandriva, do I? That doesn't mean I have an anti-Mandriva bias. It just means they're not really moving the needle much these days, so they don't really work their way up into the coverage very often. Well, and I think it's also worth mentioning, someone will undoubtedly point out, okay, then why, are, why do we, does it appear that we quote-unquote rip on Ubuntu but not on Mandriva? And my response to that would be simply because we have a set of expectations for this particular distro, one that we've had a lot of great experiences with, and we just simply want to see certain right. things addressed, and that's not yeah. happening, the at least speaking for myself. Uh, Ubuntu's relevance in the marketplace makes yeah. it more likely to receive criticism. And it also makes it more likely to receive praise and hype. I mean, there, there's two sides to that coin. Absolutely. Higher expectations. And so, like, yep. in the chat room's pointing out, why do we dog on Mir and not Whale? Well, actually, I don't really think we dog on Mir. In fact, if you trace you the... Mir in the last... <laughs> well, no. But if you trace the history of our show back, when Mir was announced, we were some of the biggest defenders of, hey, let him try it. Let him give, give him space and let him do something. And we took so much shit for that. Like Matt and I dressed I, up in a monkey suit. Exactly. I mean, you know, you know. Exactly. Pitka. I brought the monkey suit to bed. Like we were there, like saying, let him give him a shot. And the thing is, is it's not that we don't want them to still have a shot. It's just the fundamental fact is we're still waiting. That was that was a long time ago. That's fine. That's these things take time. But results at the end of the day are what we have to report on. That's what we have here to talk about. That's what the discussion is about. That's the reality. And so when OMG Ubuntu is in bold and italic saying there's no new features, not even a new wallpaper, what is the Linux Action Show supposed to say? What dick am I supposed to suck to make all of you happy? Because there is no dick I can find. Holy yeah. shit. Pretty much. Right? I mean, seriously. <laughs> There, I, I mean, I, I, so we, we are working right now on a different approach to our Ubuntu reviews that I think it's, it was producer Eric's idea, and I think it's a really solid idea that will make our Ubuntu 14.10 reviews extremely interesting. But it is requiring a completely reformulation of the way we approach a Linux distribution because we have to find something to talk about to talk about. Otherwise, we just wouldn't review it, and that doesn't seem like a good option either. I have covered this distribution for a long time. And I've never been at a point where I've literally had no idea what to say other than bad things. So I'm working. So we're working on a new formula to come up, give the respin some attention and, and, and really kind of have a nice comprehensive look at it. I'm pretty happy with where we're going with it, but it's required a total adjustment of our approach because of the situation we now find ourselves in. And I feel like, you know, there's a lot of energy being put in by our community. There's about five threads in the Linux Action Show subreddit right now, if you count threads that have also devolved into this topic. So there's two or three primary threads and one or two that have devolved into this topic. Currently live in the Linux Action Show subreddit, claiming that we are so far off base with Ubuntu 14.10 because of our biases and et cetera, et cetera. It's, there's no way for me to tell you this. There's no anti-Ubuntu agenda here. There's no arch bias here. There is a bias towards winning. There is some Linux elitism because we've been Linux users for a very long time and we start to know when something smells like shit and we start to know when something's winning and we call it like it is. There, I will grant you the, those things. Bias towards winning and an elitism that isn't arch elitism, it's just a Linux user elitism. That just, it's just there because honestly, after you see enough of this crap, you start to tell people to get off your lawn. It's not a function of being uh, against Ubuntu. It's just calling a spade a spade or whatever the saying is. I don't even know. It's just that's, what, that, that's where we're at right now. And I, I want to address this because I'm seeing there's a lot of energy being put into this. So here's a great – and there's some great posts. I mean like a lot of thought is being put into this stuff. But it's kind of, it's kind of misguided in the sense that the trouble is we – we will continue to say if something's bad, we will. I, I believe it is our responsibility if something isn't going right. We cannot sit here on this show that is the number one watched Linux media. I cannot sit on that show and say something is great when it's not great. It is our responsibility in any way we can to help these things move along in the right direction. If that's just our voice that's just echoing the, the, the thought of some users, that's fine. If other projects watch this stuff and go, hmm, 
Maybe we should rethink this. That's great. It doesn't really matter, but we, we have to be genuine to what we believe. And you have to understand that it's, it's, not, it's not about us going after Shuttleworth or making Popey cry or anything like that. Because at the end of the day, if you watch the show long enough, you will know that if they start producing results, if in 2015 we start seeing several great phone models come out, and and it's kind of great, and you know down the road uh, Unity 8's got its bugs worked out, and it's great, and mirrors, we will be beyond elated to cover that on the show. I love covering stuff that rocks under Linux. That's why the word action is in the Linux action show. We like covering the stuff that kicks the most ass every single week in Linux and open source. I will be the happiest person. Trust me. I, nobody will be happier than Chris because it'll be great content for the Linux action show when they have something that we all love. Go ahead, Poppy. You got your mic open. You might as well go. So... There's a few things I I didn't know about your review until because I was away at a conference over the oh, weekend that's and then fine. someone that's fine and then someone pointed it out to me and so I I watched it a bit earlier on and there's a few things that struck me one was that you kind of missed the fact that we've been saying all through this release that the focus yeah. is on phone we've said it over and over again oh, and I have it's not VP lost of on me it's not lost on me it's pretty apparent it. right but. You've waited until beta release before you decide to review it and then say it sucks because of what we've been saying all no, along, no, which is no, that we're not no. focused on the desktop. This is, this, is specifically, this is specifically why I aired those concerns when we were talking about the beta release, because I want to put all that out on the table and I don't want it to influence the review. It's out there now. Now it's not going to be part of the review. See, what I was essentially doing was taking that and, and, and extracting that bit of what would have been in the review and putting it in that news bit. And now when the review comes, we have a – that's not a review. Don't – that us covering something – and I'm, I'm picking on you about this because we get this all the time. Us covering a news item is not us reviewing something in the show. And it's no, a common you, misconception. You made out like that you, you specifically said that we um, make a big song and dance about it, which we didn't. We've mailed a mailing list saying the beta is out. OMG post an article about it. That doesn't mean we've made a song and dance about 1410. We haven't made a song and dance no, about no, 1410 no, because we're not focused on it. No, I think Matt's point there was that there used to be a song and dance. And now no, there's you not specifically said about there being a song and dance. Anyway, that that was one thing was, you know, why why bring it up when, you know, we keep saying this is not a big release. It's not the first big release that's um, that's not been uh, that's not had major because it's stuff it's in more it. unusual for the in between LTSs to be so boring. It's more often, you know, the LTS is about the refinement and the polish and then the, the big experimentation happens in the dot ten release, and that's always the well, one. Well, really, six ten didn't change much. Twelve ten didn't change a lot, but twelve ten had the shopping lens, so everybody had something to talk about. Right. But well, I, no, I think a lot of, of interesting were, things have were, happened in the ten releases, and shopping lens is obviously the big one. And this but one, those were both post LTS releases. Right. That's my they, point. They didn't have yeah, and they didn't have tremendously huge game changing things in. Are you going except, back to six like ten? I mean, that's. Well, that was the first one that came to mind. Okay, because right. the ones in the middle have <laughs> okay. had the ones the ones after that had Unity, and obviously that's a massive yeah, thing exactly. for people to talk about. I mean, this, so, so here's, the other th the, the other thing is there's it's not just Ubuntu. You 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 know not a lot has changed in Ubuntu, but then there's Kubuntu, Lubuntu, Zubuntu, Ubuntu right. Studio, Mythbuntu, Ubuntu, that's, Ubuntu so that's, Studio. I agree. That's You're, where the interesting that's just stuff is happening. Distro. Right. It's one well, flavor of oh, the distro. Oh, now now they're just one flavors. Now now when that's the only place where the innovation is happening, now Ubuntu is just one of the many flavors. But of course, when all it the is. innovations it's happening, it's always been one of the many flavors. Now, of course, of course, it always yeah. They're just yeah. It's just one of. It's the main dog. And the point is, is all the innovation, all the excitement is happening in all of the other flavors, which. You know, it worked great I for a lot say of. There was a lot of excitement going on in any of the others either. Oh, ouch! To be honest, there's, there's some of them are in here, dude. <laughs> Look at the Mate. Not... Kubuntu's got Plasma Five preview, dude. That's great. That's that's, that's huge. In, that's not that's not in the archive for the release. That's a preview ISO, isn't it? In the same way that Unity Eight Next and, is a preview and ISO. Also, the Mate project isn't officially in Ubuntu flavor. It seems like there's a common thread Which here. Which is one that I didn't list. My point is specifically because it's not an official. So you project. don't think it's a problem that all of the interesting things are happening in all of the distros based off you? I didn't say that. I said there are other distros that uh, there are other flavors of Ubuntu, and there are interesting things going on there. You only focused on Ubuntu. You didn't mention any of the others. Because what I was that's the talking. point I was making. 
those others were going to those again this was this wasn't a full review this is an announcement of the ubuntu 14.10 beta Right. When in yeah. fact, yeah. Ubuntu doesn't participate in the uh, the alphas and betas as much as all the others do. So it would be more interesting to talk about all the others on this particular release. Oh, I like how you're tell. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. So, uh, Popey, you don't. No, is that not is that not fair to say that these these guys are all participating and building up to a beta see, release? But you so don't it would see be the, good to talk about them. You don't see the justification you're doing here. You don't see how. How by you don't see the deferment that's happening by saying, well, yeah, of course, nothing's happening in Ubuntu, but don't, don't pay attention to main Ubuntu. Don't pay attention to the most important distribution. Don't put the attention to all the one that has all the people officially working for Canonical on. Pay attention to all the ones based off of us. Pay attention to these guys over here. This is a total no, change. I'm just saying that these others are just as important as Ubuntu. And you know, we, that's we not true at all. Support. That's not true at all. And you know that's not true at all. No, that is not true. They are very important, but they are not yeah, as important as I Ubuntu. Don't... I don't believe that they're not as important oh, as Ubuntu at all. Oh, come on. Come on. No, I don't. We have an archive that has a variety of desktops, and more than there are flavors. You know, there's lots of other desktops in the archive that are important. In fact, Mate is now in the archive as well. And they're all important. None of them are. None of them I love are all my children. <laughs> exactly. I know, I know years ago, KDE felt themselves as the blue-headed stepchild. And that was that was frustrating because we put a lot to of work far, into they all are of them. The blue-headed stuff. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. I, I, yeah, I, I'm well, not a fan. So um, <laughs> I think I, I think you know wait. You're entitled to your opinion, of course. I, I it's, just but think, it's not an opinion. I mean, yes, my opinion that it is dis my, where the opinion comes in is in my disappointment. But the fact of the matter is, there really is nothing to talk about. Right. Okay. But you could argue that that's the same thing with every LTS. This isn't like an LTS it, release. No, this the no, same package with every every time there's something that they release right after an LTS, it always happens. It's just more refinement to the to the LTS. Not always. The no, that's kind of my point. 10, 12, 10, 14, 10, it's the same. You just you just listed all the ones where they rolled out major changes to the Unity dash including search and privacy features. You just, the ones you just named where there was massive changes. No, the 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 12, 10, 10 was the Gnome 2. 12.10 was a, a slight changes with the, the the adding search, adding Amazon search to it. That's not but a slight change. Part, That's not a slight change. That's a huge change. As far as functionality, it's the same. I mean, it's, it's not. It's like it's basically. All right. I, I don't want to argue version numbers. You add Amazon search to the dashboard. That's a big change. There's a lot to talk about. When you're an LTS, just being an LTS, that's something to talk about. Okay, you guys and. It, it, we're getting down into the weeds of what versions of Ubuntu have what features. The important part is what we really, what I want to make walk walking from is a that wasn't a review. Okay, we're going to do something different for the actual review where we'll look, at, we'll take a look at the spin. So, so don't consider that like our final opinion on Ubuntu 14.10. However, we are at a, an interesting point in Ubuntu's history right now. We're kind of in the thick of it, and we are documenting what happens while they are making this huge, huge huge transition. This is what happens right now. We don't know, and we're not casting what's going to happen. We're not projecting what's going to happen. But what we do know is right now what we get. What So what we will get in the long run is potentially a competitive mobile operating system that has some great features that could tie in really nicely with desktops and offer power Linux users a great experience. But what we have today is not a great experience for Linux power users today. And that's what we're documenting. The fact that Just we... Just because we released 12.10 doesn't make 12.04 instantly Ob uh, sorry, 14 doesn't make 1404 instantly right. obsolete. Actually, I think that's the interesting thing about 1410 is in a lot of ways, it doesn't change 1404's relevance at all. You add a few PPAs to 1404, you don't even have to change anything, right? Right. And we do hardware enablement kernels and uh, XORG backports right. to uh, the LTS release. So, yeah. So... You could you could consider fourteen ten to be uh, not exciting, not that much going on. So fine, that that's happened in the past. We're yeah. focused on other stuff, and we'll come back to desktop next release. I kind of feel like, I mean, so why am I getting beat up on for saying that? I don't know. I I, I that, that's I was quite surprised myself that people reacted so badly. I, my only point was that you only focused on Ubuntu and right. didn't focus on the well, others. Well, that was a little sleight of hand because I plan to focus more on the respins later, and I figured I'd get that criticism out of the way so that way it wasn't in the review. It's all sort of pre-setting up the review. It's me kind of 
so uh, like uh, so some of this was was format formatting for the show for for the arc of the story here like i didn't talk about unity's multi-touch support because we had just talked about that and i was talking about gnome so people took that as me sliding unity and then when we got to the ubuntu 1410 discussion i didn't really talk about the remixes and the reflavors because that's what we're going to focus on in the review because what the hell else can we focus on and i don't want to just spend the whole review criticizing all of the mistakes and re retrashing the software center like we like we often do so we got it out right there in the news segment now it's done now it's sort of like it's it's setting up the narrative for the review setting up the expectations setting up w w the state of things and then I'll tell you what i'm really looking forward to this review this sounds awesome and then we deliver well we'll see i mean maybe not <laughs> <laughs> we'll see but you know uh, so uh, I guess people kind of jump down like uh, our throats for it, a lot lately whenever we kind of bring up the topic of Ubuntu. And it, it sort of feels like there's an expectation that uh, we really should only talk about the good stuff. And I could agree there could be more good stuff we talk about. Yeah, uh, but we get grief for that too, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that was, that was the do, thing. is like know. we used to get a ton of grief about that. Um, but this week it was particularly strong. So I don't know if we've helped. I don't know if we've made any sense in any of this. But I... I I definitely want well, to. I want to tamp down. I want to. I, I find it insulting. I find it personally insulting to be called an arch fanboy because it implies that I am so simple-minded that my preference for one distribution over another would somehow like infect how I think oh, about was, everything in my life. When really, there was one other thing. Oh yeah, go um, on. I forgot to mention the uh, the gnome release schedule, meaning that we don't have the latest and greatest gnome in in our. Yeah, releases okay, anymore, that was yeah, that's a good. Which, one, yeah. That you know, that's that's kind of sad, and it's a bit frustrating that we can't sync those things up. Um, it would be nice if we could, uh, yeah. but you know, our six months releases have been like that for ten years. Mm -hmm. And when we had GNOME as a desktop, I think we made exceptions and would pull it in at the last minute. Yeah. But now, uh, now GNOME isn't our default desktop. So you know, should we should we bust a gut to get GNOME in there for the final release when it isn't even our default desktop? I agree. That's, I think, yeah. and and the fact that there is a pretty good PPA system in place where you can grab it. the 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 reason right. why, and I I don't think I said this in the show, but the reason why I would love to see it, just as a personal preference, is a it would definitely make Ubuntu feel much more like a contender for me to use as my daily driver. But there's there's Ubuntu Gnome Edition, uh, but also it just kind of seems like maybe while Unity isn't seeing a lot of stuff, while we're just going you know just small bug fixes here and there, wouldn't it be really cool if there was a, a you know a very fresh being worked on desktop available to me to choose from and that would be gnome 314 and to be honest with you i i honestly think a lot of linux users are going to install fedora 21 because it'll be one of the first distros that does gnome 314 out of the box and they will install it just for that reason alone and so if it would just be a nice feather in the ubuntu 1410's cap if it could be like a great way to get gnome 3.14 right out of the box that's why i kind of brought it up because i think that would be a great combo while unity's kind of on the shelf, but I understand, you know, release schedules and whatnot. That's just how it goes. And the PPA solve that. Um, that's fine. Chat room mentions, you know, maybe it's not what we're talking, but maybe it's how it's brought up. Um, I think maybe that's potentially true, but at the end of the day, you have to understand that we have to provide some level of entertainment too. So there has to be something to engage people. There has to be something that makes people really feel passionate and want to, you know, engage with us because sometimes... Uh, if you just keep it really dry and boring, uh, people get bored and they tune out. So sometimes it well, might be pre yeah. if it's presented in a certain way that you find offensive, consider that maybe it's being presented in a certain way to grab attention. Well, it's and the for the love of God, people, stop being so friggin' sensitive. I mean, that's my <laughs> big thing. Is I, uh, first and foremost, I recommend to Ubuntu to everybody. I do. And I rip on them hard because I have high expectations. Everyone I know that recently switched to Linux is using Ubuntu, and I will continue to do so because it's a good distro. I will also continue to rip on it because I care. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, throw the, I'll throw this in for you, Chris. Today I installed Fedora 21, what? Fedora 20, and Antegros. <laughs> Good, good on you. Why, good what on you. would possess you to do so? Such a thing. <laughs> uh, you'll find out later. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> okay mystery, right. I like it. <laughs> um, so uh, I just I don't know. I don't know if we're gonna ever re resolve this because it's it's such a fundamental. Like I understand, you know, you guys are really passionate about some of these projects. Some of you don't just contribute, you know, your 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 voice, but you also contribute your time and your code, um, and. I don't. Uh, I don't want to discourage anybody from volunteering on any open source project they're into, and I hope. I hope you will maybe um, consider just stick with us for a little bit and consider that uh, 
our opinions are not I, I, I think it's a benefit to be somebody who constantly reevaluates the way they think about things and their opinions of things. And you can see over time those will transition. Um, there's a lot of things over the history of the Linux Action Show where we were, came down pretty hard on something, and as they were, as those things were addressed, our, our, our I mean, I, I, for GNOME is another one. GNOME three. Oh yeah. Right. I mean, no, and, and, and the reason was is at first GNOME three was no good. It just was no good, and it has gotten a lot better. And now our our tone, our coverage of GNOME, has changed to reflect that. It's it's just kind of natural if you think about it. It's not that weird. It just it does. It's it, it just kind of it's not a fanboy thing. It's it's just action speak well, louder than words. I'm teasing it off a lot, Wimpy. What are what what process are we about to go through right now? Right. Okay. So uh, everyone probably knows uh, that's listening to this that Ubuntu Mate 14.10 was released a couple of weeks ago, and we've been preparing an Ubuntu Mate 14.04 release. And I'm actually re- ready to go through the keystrokes to release it live now. So we're going to release the latest version, which is based on 14.04. Right here. That's on air. right. Let's do it. Let's right do here it. on air. So this okay, is so, this is fun. So I've got my Terminator sessions open, and I've logged into my two digital o- ocean build servers. This is where I prepare the ISO images. I've already prepared the images, and I'm going to run the release scripts. And the release scripts build the WebSeed torrents, actually make the ISOs from the SquashFS add the assets from the official Ubuntu uh, CD releases, and then I'll sync them to my distribution servers. So we'll do that now. So uh, off we go. Right, so that's the power of DigitalOcean. That's just shunted six gigabytes of data. Really? Wow. We'll now um, just edit the release flag on the article. Now we'll run the deploy script. This is so exciting. <laughs> I know, right? I know. <laughs> this is actually the geekiest thing I think so, we've ever done on the show, and I love it. So the deploy script uh, basically takes all the markdown that uh, the site is generated from and turns it into HTML. So that's done. So now I go to my CDN, and I prefetch all of those images into the CDN. And... That's done, and now I purge the blog index from my Cloudflare in, uh, and that just makes sure that the updates go through, and I think we're done. <laughs> so, so you do the web witness to a loper- an operating system being released live. So you push the whole website and everything in that. Yeah, and there you go. So if you go to ubuntumate.org/blog, the article that you'll see now is the release notes and the article. So and if you go to ubuntumate.org slash download. Uh, yes, that that should redirect, I think, because there's uh, there's two yeah. uh, two bits in there. You know what, Wimpy, you just earned yourself. Very nice, sir. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> let's stop talking about the future for a second, and let's talk about something I think most desktop Linux users who bounce around desktop environments have experienced. You you ever seen this problem, Matt, where like you got you got an application and it has like a little system tray icon and maybe uh, uh, that particular developer decided I don't want to implement um, the the app indicator support for Ubuntu. So when you're in Ubuntu's Unity desktop, you don't get an icon up in the right hand corner. But when you're in KDE, you do get the icon and no, maybe it's hit and miss. You know, you, you've seen this kind of thing, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's something I've definitely experienced, but it also colors based on the, the level of difficulty, which direction I'm going to go through. Um, sure. Because uh, I've certainly had that experience both in Unity and KDE, um, less in GNOME. But um, yeah. yeah, it's you know certainly uh, certainly happened. Sure. And see, I feel like I've had more success in like almost all of the uh, little tray icons show up in KDE. It's totally yeah. hit and miss in Unity, and GNOME's gotten a lot better about it, but it's still hit and miss in GNOME. And yeah. this Itty bitty tiny bit of fragmentation was introduced when a couple of different desktops decided to implement, or really one desktop decided to implement app indicators differently than the other desktops. And even True. today, years later, we still get that wrong. And let's let's be clear for what it is. It looks like amateur hour. It looks pathetic. It's something that the Mac OS or Chrome OS or Windows would never get wrong and does not ever get wrong. It looks ridiculous. And I think we have to be clear when we're having this conversation that this type of little itty bitty fragmentation has much wider ramifications in how people 
appreciate and experience a desktop. And this, as I'm going to use this example because it's something we can all relate to, and then we're going to look at the larger ramifications of the fragmentation at the display server level. But what I want us all to think about as we are moving forward in this conversation is look at the future directory of Linux, of desktop Linux, quote unquote, desktop Linux competition. Because it's not Windows. It might be Windows today. It might be Windows for the next few years. But five, ten years down the road, on the high end, it's Mac OS X. On the low uh -huh. end, it's Chrome OS and Android. And those desktops would never be caught dead with that kind of amateur hour implementation. That was not going to happen. And that is our competition. If you look at the forward directory of the trajectory of the desktop market, that's who we're competing against. And those platforms, specifically Android, Chrome OS, and Mac OS X, already have a worldwide distribution system with massive amounts of momentum behind them. They have stores in, in almost every country around the world. You can order online. They have a brand image around them. And that's what future Linux is going to be competing with. That's what we're competing with, and we are not even bringing our A game. We're not even we're not even doing a very good job with our current setup. And now we're about to introduce fragmentation at the core level of the desktop that we have A never had fragmentation before, and B are fundamentally under resourced to properly develop it as it is. The X team already split to have one team work on X11 and one term. One team work on Wayland. Well, think about right. this. What if Ubuntu, had, in some parallel universe, had decided to go with Wayland? That would mean millions of more users banging on Wayland. That would mean more bug fixes, more refinement at a higher pace to Wayland, making that core part of the Linux desktop experience more refined, more tested, more performant. All of these things that matter, especially as game developers are moving over to Linux. But instead, we are splitting our resources. We are splitting our attention. We are splitting our testing. We are splitting our development time. And at the same time, we are introducing all kinds of fragmentation that developers are going to have to account for. Because here's how humans work, right? You're going to have your distribution. You're going to develop on that. It's either going to be a Wayland-based distribution or a Mir-based distribution. And whatever it is, that's the one you're going to properly test on because that's the one you use. And that's the one that the features are going to work correctly on. When I go to the next track in Clementine, whichever distro display server the Clementine developer is using for, that's the one I need to use if I want the next track on screen notification, and that's even more amateur hour. We are introducing a level of fragmentation at the core of Linux that will mean that applications are even more hit and miss now in what they feature. Does this application have a screenshot button? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, depends on what desktop you're on. Do you get an on-screen display? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. And here's another reason why you need to care. Because if you only want to use Unity for the rest of your life, then Mirror's going to work great for you. But if you ever want to use Ubuntu with another distribution, well, you better learn how to install Wayland. You better figure out, you're going to, this is going to be an explosion in block post on how to load Wayland on Ubuntu desktops because everybody out there that wants to use anything but Unity ever is going to need to learn how to install Wayland on their Ubuntu machine. And that's another reason why you should care. The reasons stack up. And this, these very issues, these these fundamental issues are exactly the kind of thing that affect users. So while I might not care if it's Mirror Wayland, I sure as hell care if my application doesn't work correctly. I sure as hell care if I have to spend an hour figuring out how to install Wayland on my Ubuntu install so that way I can try out GNOME 3 whatever. It's it, it does absolutely affect users. It fundamentally affects users. I think it also slows down uh, adoption uh, in a very serious way because Big I think time. over time. Yeah, and that's that's the piece that I see the bigger because at the end of the day, gr granted, I fall back to my old the market will sort it out and it will, but we shouldn't have to sort it out in the first place. I mean, that's the big piece of it right there is that we're spending unneeded time sorting this out when it shouldn't have been an issue in the first place at right. all. Right. And, um, and but you yeah, look at yeah, it and like, it's going to get sorted, but it's going to be like a 10 year process. And so developers be, are always like, oh, Linux is too fragmented. I don't know what I should target. This just changes the equation even more. Yeah. Uh, you look at how 3D games capture the mouse pointer. That's going to be different between desktops or uh, display environments. It, that's going to... Game developers are going to have to uh, think about this kind of stuff. And the other thing is, I, you know, from my old contracting background, and Aaron touches on this in his post, and I thought it was really well done. He says, think about it from an IT support perspective, right? You already get people like... what I, I, I had several clients that had Linux on the desktop and the you know the question the problems would always arise if they one person was on one distro and another person was on another distro one person would have something work another person wouldn't and then it would be oh well you need the uh, build utils well what's that called on Fedora what's that called on Ubuntu I mean it's already right. the the diversity that we have there while in some ways in strengthens and empowers Linux it also from a support standpoint is already too complicated well that's what's just going to happen when the display server changes currently as Aaron writes. Guides and manuals covering Linux can assume that Xorg is running and other troubleshooting tips with that assumption can be in place. This is also one reason why the Linux world is standardizing on systemd is such a good thing. 
Support will become easier when we don't have to ask, are you using system with system 5 in it, system 7 in it, system D, right. upstart? You just have to start troubleshooting at that level. Multiple display systems will produce a similar result. In commercial settings, this also translates to more cost, particularly to companies who provide professional IT support for companies running desktop systems. Does this matter to users? Well, it means less clear documentation, more difficult support for Linux, and higher commercial support costs. So yes, I would argue that matters to users. And man, did that resonate with me because I have been, I have watched Linux go from the <laughs> joke when I recommend it to, yeah, let's yeah. implement Linux, right? And I, I have been advocating the deployment of Linux in businesses for years. And I was already feeling the pushback from like the, my doctor clients all wanted Macs. And all my doctors wanted to get Macs. And I really, right. it is, you know, as soon as that support argument is brought up, uh, my arguments are completely deflated because how do you compete with Apple stores everywhere? How do you compete with a, a you know a warranty in writing and a system that's honestly less of a moving target? It's really well, it's hard for me to fight against that. Yep, it's a unified experience that I don't. Even if we go System D, we go Wayland, we go the whole thing. We still don't have a unified experience. We don't at any level, and, and it's we're not even near that. It's happening yeah. at a time where we could be coalescing around Wayland. We could be coalescing right. around System D, right? And these are major coalescings that could be happening. Uh, and, exactly. And he says, if they get, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say, if they get those two and they get the packaging figured out, you know, Bob's your uncle. You're good. That, uh, those three things together would do wonders. He, Aaron points out, you know, this matters to display systems. One thing free software does not have is enough of its graphic developers. With Xorg, there were exactly one place you could contribute to if you wanted to push forward the display stack on a free software operating system, such as Linux. Then Mir came along and introduced a split in the developer community which means fewer human resources applied to a topic that really needs every single pair of hands we have. Instead of one system that is good as we can make it, we'll end up with a slower development of two systems with the risk of more of them being less than great. And I, I think this part could be argued because you could say good competition spurs uh, good innovation. But at the same time, if, you know, if you're familiar with the, with the core X development, you know how bad that situation is and how much we do need all hands on deck for that kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, uh, Aaron points that this is obviously no minor task. Mir was originally promised to be the display system of choice in desktop Ubuntu uh, in 2013-10. Then it was pushed back to 2014-04, and now it's pushed out to 2016-04. This is not a trivial sort of project, and making it harder by limiting human resources available is unwise. And I think what we fall back on too often, and I think something we can chant, there's a couple of things we chant a lot in the Linux community. Well, yeah, maybe KD isn't making you happy. But you know what? It's great because you got choice. Well, that choice is not all that great if none of the choices are awesome. So, yes. uh, but you know, Saigo says he's hopeful. He says, I do hold out hope. The free software community is speaking with a singular voice. And that voice is saying, after X, it's Wayland. Wayland itself is still being worked on and has reached a level of maturity that allows real world use. Several of the major desktop products are well on their way of supporting it as a first class option, including Plasma by KDE, Gnome Shell, and Enlightenment. All the major toolkits upstream have support for Wayland today, and Wayland has the broadest driver support next only to X itself. So that's a good point to be made, so he's a little hopeful. And he goes on to say the Mir team keeps bringing up these topics, although so does the KDE team. What's up? Uh, but he says maybe they need to defend their position. So does the KDE team. I can emphasize with how... Uh, how they, how, how, I, I don't want to repeat what he's saying here, but what he says is, sure. I can emphasize that they are working on something they truly believe in and they're being told it's the wrong thing to do. He says, I feel it is their right to develop Mir at their heart's content uh, and I cheer their moxie. Similarly, it is our right as developers and users to choose what to support and what not to. Such decision making is aided by having an accurate and complete information. And it's with that goal in mind that I wrote the post above. And I thought this was a great post because I think what we are entering into is an era of unprecedented fragmentation in the graphical space for Linux. And I want to yes. and I and I I want to reel it back in here because I'm pretty upset about this the more I think about this because what I see this potentially as is I see this as I don't want to use the words I'm thinking of but the He's a politically correct version maybe. Well, <laughs> <You know? laughs> it is it is hobbling desktop yeah. applications in order to push forward the Ubuntu agenda. Because yeah. I don't believe we can... We have already seen Unity itself introduce a, lay, a level of fragmentation that is below commercial desktops, that would be intolerable for commercial desktops. We have already oh, seen yeah. that... They've already seen the, the play out of that. So when you introduce some fundamental stuff at the, at the display server level, you either have two options as a developer. 
you try to target both main display servers and one of those targets is probably not going to be as optimal as the other or you simply ignore one altogether. In either scenario, users lose. So if you don't care about what display server you're using, then you probably ought to stop using Linux because at the, at the end of the day, this is going to fundamentally change how the application landscape looks on Linux. And even if it is just one application has an on-screen display on one display server and doesn't on the other, that is enough to have me upset because that is unacceptable. It is not good enough. And I want the most kick-ass display server possible. We have the sure. most kick-ass kernel possible. How about we get the rest of the stack as kick-ass as we can? And to sabotage a display server like this for one company's personal gain in a mobile market that is not likely to be tremendously successful anyways feels awfully selfish to me right now. Well, you know, I honestly, and I think even Valve will be included in this, I don't think anyone's going to give a rip and rat's butt about Mirror one way or the other going forward. I really don't. I think just from the backyard developer guy who's doing this in his boxer shorts down to the multi-billion dollar corporation, I don't. I think they're going to look at this fundamentally and be like, you know, honestly, uh, I'm going to go whichever way the community is going, whichever way the, uh, you know, the video card vendors are going, whichever way direction they're headed – Basically, it's a numbers game, and so I think this potentially – I'm hoping, I'm right on this, that this could work itself out fairly early on. I'm hoping. The more I think about it, the more I think that well, it's uh, – that's a good point. You know, look, I mean, yeah, you I could, hope so. I mean it's I definitely so. early days, and I think something I wanted yeah. to kind of kick around to the mumble room is maybe abstraction can solve it because we're all looking at this yeah. with today's set of problems and today's set of uh, tools to solve this problem. Sure. And I think also – you know, uh, something that Martin and Aaron were trying to make the push is, is developers are users too. And in fact, I think developers make up a good user base of Linux, right? I think that's probably who a lot of the develop, uh, users are, are developers. So right. by impacting developers, you are impacting the users of Linux. And I think you're going to, that's, that's a segment that's going to continue to outgrow any other segment of Linux usage. Uh, yes. But I, uh, I don't know, anybody in the mumble room want to take a first shot at this? Is this a, is this a problem that future Chris and Matt aren't even going to have to worry about? So can I ask you a question, Chris? Go for it, Poppy. Um, what's the single most used display server on Linux right now, as in in most in most deployments? Xorg. No, Surface Flinger on Android in way more deployments than anything else. Wayland, Mir, or Xorg. Mm, good, good trick question, Poppy. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good well one. Played. You got to be good well on that one. <laughs> Surface, Flinger, Surface Flinger is the display server on Android. Nobody seems to have told them that they can't have their own internal project for a display server, which is used but on don't you think the millions difference, of devices. But the difference why, there... Why do, we get, why do we get that flag? But isn't the difference there... Don't? Those are. The, but that's, uh, that's sort of, in a sense a whole cloth creation, right? Where it's a whole new ecosystem with a whole new set of apps that are, are designed for that system. But on, on the Linux side... Just like Ubuntu phone. Yeah, exactly. Well, if anything, the most biggest problem is it's a whole different paradigm compared to our legacy or at least what everything else has ever been. I mean, I think Poby makes a good point, but I think that I think the, the subtle difference is that you only have to target sur for Surface Flinger on Android. All right? So when you're making your Android apps, it's not really something that even has to be a consideration. But on No, you don't. You don't. Because the stack, that's abstracted away from you in exactly the same way that Robert and Robert Carr have both blogged about. That stuff so is you abstracted would, away from you by the toolkit. You would disagree then with the assertion that Saigo and Martin are making that uh, it's not quite as abstract as everyone would like. No, I'm, I'm suggesting that there are certain edge cases where you need to know about the underlying fundamental bits and pieces. And yeah, a screenshot tool is a real easy shooting fish in a barrel, um, <laughs> or, you know, one to pick because it, it obviously needs interaction with the display server. But there are way more applications out there than there are screenshot tools. And there are way more developers out there developing tools with toolkits, which will just work on these display servers and won't have this problem. Hmm. So you say that Canonical has the amount of influence and power that Google has when it comes to the mobile marketplace is just a little bit of a excessive statement. Uh, did I say that? When it comes to comparing Surface Slinger to Mirror, a little bit. No, they didn't. To it, all I'm, all I'm suggesting carpet, it's not is actually that, important. All I'm suggesting is that that it's it's entirely possible for someone to come up with a display server on Linux which isn't Wayland and isn't X, and for them to deploy that to a large number of 
handsets around the world and it work. And for application developers to do their work on top of that and not really care that it's surface fling underneath and not Xorg or Wayland or whatever. So I think the fundamental disagreement I see here is one side thinks that it's really not going to be that big of an, um, ramifications for developers or, or application functionality. And another side seems to disagree with that position. The surface area of mobile is also far smaller in a way that it's very specific. Its kernel is predefined other than the CyanogenMods mods or whatever personally built mods that Android has. Otherwise, the desktop is very, very different. There's a lot more yeah. ambiguity. And, and it's a lot harder to do, which is one of the reasons why Mir hasn't landed in the desktop. Right, and well, it's kind of the point you mentioned that if it comes down to, here's a toolkit you can use to build your app, and it'll guarantee it'll work, that works, but that's not a model that Linux has typically gone well, with before. I, th I, think, uh, I think their argument is, is no toolkit is actually that comprehensive. There's, there's bugs or there's just gaps in what it's capable of providing that eventually... It'll work in a special case of Unity pretty much only. I think their argument is eventually, you know, there's, there's, you have to close a few gaps, and when you do that, you got to write directly to the display server. You can't write to the toolkit. And I think, I think the, I think the and concept I, I, of a perfect toolkit is sort of, sort of like a, it's sort of like a dream. But I don't think we've ever, in the history of computing, achieved the perfect toolkit. No, and I, I agree with the. There are going to be holes in every toolkit, and there are bits that we're going to have to do at the plumbing layer, um, and components that we're going to have to provide that won't be provided by Q. We know that, and and we're building those as we go. And yeah, this is a bit of a learning exercise for us as well. But I I don't think um, the the criticism is is necessary. I don't think it's as as warranted as as some might think. It, it it's in some ways it feels like okay right we've got them to switch the system D right what's next oh yes me right let's have a go at them about that again. let's see if we can get them to change that one now <laughs> right yeah I I I guess what I'm worried about is um I'm worried that wishful thinking is influencing that thinking because it in an ideal world I think I I think that's too ideal and I think the history of specifically desktop Linux shows us that things are very fluid and things are never quite as great as we want them to be and the idealism usually gives away a little bit of pragmatism and I think at the end of the day uh, there's a lot of bets on um, things kind of coming together at the right time to make all of this work. Uh, I think. I think Ubuntu's time is coming to an end soon because, I mean, they've been alienating and alienating the user base so much over the years with Unity, with Mirror, with... Uh, um, yeah, I don't know about and, that. You know, you know Riley, I hear so that a lot, when Riley, but the thing is, is, evidence of it. Yeah. the thing is, is you, you can't discount the massive cloud deployment that Ubuntu has, which will naturally push a lot of developers and sysadmins to want to run Ubuntu. I mean, they're doing really great there. Uh, and I think also, uh, I, I think let's look at it from a, from an, from an alternate perspective. What if uh, we fast forward three years down the road or uh, 2016 or whatever it is, um, where we have like this great QT based desktop, which I think a lot of us think QT has a strong future ahead of it. You know, uh, maybe this is a little bit further down the road, but it's sitting on si top of system D. Uh, the only piece that has a lot of questions is how is, I think what people are really worried about is uh, uh, the fragmentation being introduced at such a critical layer. I mean, we can all argue about package names and how they're different between all distributions or the locations of certain libraries on how they can be different or where the config goes can be different. But we've, we as a user base and as developers have never had to worry about that display layer. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's gotten old and it, you know, it, it's time has come to be replaced. But at the, at the same time, it has been at least a consistent thing, not just across Linux, but also across Linux and the BSDs. It is a consistent aspect for software development when you're targeting these systems that is now no longer going to be consistent. And I think except, you cannot understand that. that. Except for that other... Uh, platform that you keep forgetting about that that has more deployments than all of those well that i mean there sure. there is a reality to that but i you know i'm very focused on the actual desktop desktop aspect of linux and maybe you know down the road uh, i i mean we're already seeing more and more laptops that are shipping with android i just recently saw a post for a full-fledged desktop with a keyboard mouse and monitor running android uh, so, I mean, you know, it could be a fair point that, again, we don't know what the future has ahead of us. But right now I'm really focused on 
you know, making my desktop version of Linux better than ever. And I'm, I'm really worried that if we cock this up and, and if we get this wrong at this critical time with, with uh, new types of companies getting on board and making great products, but also all of the desktop environments are getting to the point now where they're so good that it's these little things that bug us, like the indicators and all this kind of stuff. We're really getting to a good point. And if we kind of screw this up, I just, Android and Chrome OS and and the Mac are going to eat us alive. It's been a lot of fun having the spirited conversations. I think one of the things I love about Popey's is he's always willing to have a great spirited conversation, and then we have a laugh at the end of it. Uh, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. Linux Unplugged for me over 2014 has changed a bit, uh, and I really like where it's gone. It's become a place to openly talk about issues that we as Linux users experience. It's a place for Linux users to talk about this stuff. It's one part talk show, maybe one part counseling a little bit. Uh, and also we get those surprisingly great insights from our mumble room. And that's always been And having great guests just randomly show up. Join us for a live show sometime, won't you? Our mumble room is always open. We just got to check your mic and you can submit topics to our subreddit, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. We'll see you back here on the 30th for some of our virtual lugs 2015 predictions. You can be part of that. It should be a great episode. Thanks so much, everybody. See you right here next Tuesday.